Okay, we had gotten in your story to the point where you had finished your intelligence training at Fort Holford, Maryland, and then they're sending you uh, to college now to actually get a bachelor's degree finally, like officers are supposed to have. Right. Okay. Now, was there another piece or two that you wanted to fill in before continuing? Yeah, I, I wanted to recall a, a time in April 1966 we were deployed and we were engaged with an enemy that was moving. Uh, and, and I think it was in the Bong Son area again. We went, went back there several times, mm -hmm. and, and, and I was the intelligence officer and, and still had my connectivity with the G2 and other people, and I'm very sensitive about certain things. I count it a real blessing that the rifle companies were really onto it, because one day I got a, I got a, a call on my radio uh, that one of the companies had shot a man riding a bicycle and he was wearing a Palm Beach suit, and he wouldn't, when they hollered, don't lie, he didn't, which means stop. Mm -hmm. And he kept going, and they, they did it three times, and then they shot him. Well, it's a good thing they did, because when they got him, they frisked him, and they got some papers from him, and, and it was just columns of numbers and words and letters, and it didn't make any sense. But but it was in good, good condition, it wasn't muddy or, nothing. So <clears throat> they uh, asked him to get a runner to me. So it took them a while, but they got a runner to me, and they gave it to me, and my, my Vietnamese interpreter looked at it, and he read it. He looked at all the pages, and he says, I, I, I don't know, but this is very, very radio secret. I said, top secret crypto? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Very, very secret radio. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I forget what uh, Colonel Hennessy, the one, the lieutenant colonel, he's now a colonel and he's a brigade commander. Mm -hmm. So I got on his frequency. And I said, I said, left half six. This is, uh, you know, whatever I was, vitamin pill two. Uh, I've got a document that you need to get from me now. He says, Roger out. <laughs> and uh, so he, his bird came in and I handed it to him. I said, this is a top secret crypto document. I, have, I can't tell you anything more about it. I just don't know. But it needs to get to Saigon immediately because they, they can decipher this silly thing. I, 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 we can't. Mm -hmm. So I gave it to him. All right, so you have to blank that out and just put that somewhere. So that, that was one thing. And then the other thing that I was told by, by interrogation, that we were in a valley and, and you had some little rising mountains and you had these little gully kind of things that went up the, between the mountains. And I was told by some of the folks we captured that, oh, we got all our storages in, in those places because you never check them. So I got a hold of the uh, artillery and I asked them, uh, if they could give us a little support, and I, I, I gave them a couple of coordinates, and they hit those coordinates, and there was a single explosion, you know, the artillery piece, and then there were secondary explosions, and followed by secondary explosions, and they just blew the side out. I, I, I don't know what was in there, but can you imagine that would have fed the, the, the bad guys some some things? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's that's recollection of what was happening in April. Okay. Now, did I already talk about June of 66? Um, what was going on in June 66? We were in the same general area, back again. And only this time, the, 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 the unit, no, we didn't talk about it. The unit also was a, a unit that was had fresh fresh troops. I, I, I got this by interrogation after we got it captured some of them. There's a fresh unit from, from the furthest reaches close to the Chinese border of North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they had moved into the area and we were outgunned. So we, we hid. I, I had 180 helicopters that we were guarding. I mean, that's a large force. And it was our battalion primarily. I think I'm correct in saying that. But they were somewhere, those helicopters were in the, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we were using them, for, we were apparently fighting the, the fringes of that organization. Had no no clue how really big it was, 
And the reason we, we, we found got, got involved was the 101st had gotten into that area and they lost a lot of, they lost a lot of troops and there was an under, understrength rifle company, I think one rifle company from the 101st and I had the name of the battalion commander but he lost, he lost, he lost control, he, he didn't have any communication with him. And so we were going to go in and try to do something whatever that was. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my battalion commander and, and the operations officer were doing something else and I flew in to set up the forward battalion operation center and uh, I was by myself with whatever whoever was with me and so we kept up with that and watched that carefully but we put a bird up there with, with all that electronic stuff hanging out the back and one of those Two engine aircraft that could loiter for us, so we could communicate. We communicated with that unit on the ground, mm -hmm. and we were able to put Bravo Company. They snuck in and they came down at night, and they, they infiltrated it and reestablished where, where there was shallow uh, defense of, of that of that area. They had an area down here that was shallow, and then there was a kind of a lifting area here, and then it backed off, and then up 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 here was mountains, but it was some distance. So anyway, um, all right, so they got in there. So the next morning, we, we, we usually have a, a mad minute. We take two magazines full of ammunition and just let it go out there anywhere. So they did that, and all of a sudden we heard bugles. They had bugles, they, they, and they attacked online. I wasn't there, but this is the report I got from Bravo Company when I got on the ground as soon as I could get there. But anyway, if they came assault and they, and, they, and they smashed through the front line there, and uh, the commanding officer, who I know quite well, a very, very astute commander, Roy was wounded in April and we took him home. So we had a new commander of Bravo Company and he's very, very excellent. And, and so he, he had one of the platoons in reserve and, and pushed those bad guys out. And, and so by the time the, the dust cleared, and, and the enemy left because they were they were soundly beat up, but they were two reinforced companies on line. That's most of a battalion, mm -hmm. and, and and we pushed them back. But we we ended up with two two hundred thirty nine killed that we got that they didn't pull away. Mm -hmm. So I got out of ground there immediately, and I knew most of the guys, and I I was hollering at them because they had dead soldiers in in, in the water. And we needed to use that water. I had them pull them out. They had cows that had been shot, uh, a water buffalo, and, and, and they were beginning to stink. I mean, it was hot. And so I had to cover them with a, with a layer of dirt. You don't mm -hmm. bury them, just cover with a layer of dirt. And, and for, the, for the soldiers that were killed, <clears throat> uh, get, get shallow grave. But, but get them covered up get, so the bugs and all that, whatever, would, wouldn't, 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 wouldn't get into your get into your food or on your body. So they did, they cleaned all that up. And, and, uh, all right, so then, then some of the other units came around us, but they didn't, we still had just Bravo Company in, in the valley mm -hmm. situation and all these dead bodies to contend with. <clears throat> A lot of equipment and, and some of the, we, we pull off the soldiers, we pull off the, the, the ammunition and it has cosmoline on it, brand new, and we had a light machine gun and they let me use it, and you just laid it on your hand and it wouldn't even lift. It's excellent, well-made light machine gun. Kalashnikovs all over the place, as well. And the assault rifle. <clears throat> that was amazing, and their uniforms were wonderful, They're excellent, fine. They weren't worn out, they weren't moth-eaten, they weren't falling apart. They weren't rotten, they were in good shape. We captured captured one company commander and a battalion commander, and another company commander was killed. So we, we, we started interrogating them and got, got rid of them quickly, because mm -hmm. we're not really fluent mm -hmm. in that stuff. And, and so we got that off to brigade. And then I, I got in a helicopter or a bubble, and I, I got up about six or seven five or six or seven thousand feet above the above what was going on trying to get an orientation and by then we had whoever was down there left of the 101st and ourselves we were in full strength our, our two other uh, well two two plus 
almost a third uh, company that, that, that could put fires on, on, on an enemy force. Mm -hmm. They were really unbelievably busy. We had seven firing batteries, six cannons each, and they were, f they were full busy trying to engage these people. They were, it was a huge, we found out they were called the Black Knights or some code name like that. that that's what they call themselves. <clears throat> And they were well trained, and their daddies must have been Chinese, but they were living in North Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they were reserve forces. That tells you they were running out of people. Mm -hmm. Nobody paid attention to that. Now, this is 1966. They should have ta paid attention to that. The thing that I got worried about is they were bigger than you. The officers were small, but the, the soldiers were as big as you. We had women in the third line. Two lines had attacked through, and the third line were nurses or I don't know what, but they picked up the weapons and they got killed. And that, that, our guys threw up over that. We don't like, we don't do that. We don't do that kind of thing. So, hmm, uh, hmm. so the seven firing batteries, and, and uh, Butch Boyette was in Charlie Company. Charlie Company had just come over to burn, was getting ready to come down the, 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 the steep slope into where the valley is, and then there was a, there was a gully here, uh, of course you don't want to go down an area to become a target, and then there was a, a, lot, a high, high ground and a ridge line on the other side. And he was reporting that he's pinned down and can't move, and he can't sneeze, he can't stand up and you know, sneeze, mm -hmm. because there was one or two rifle companies over here that pinned him down, and and he needed help. So somebody on the ground said, well, get Talmadge out of the air. He doesn't know how to fire artillery. And I thought to myself, you idiot. Everything's firing what, on the ground or stand, standing on my head. Nobody's, no, you can't engage. You don't, have, you don't have any more guns. So I don't know who did it, but it must have been it wasn't the, the Lord used somebody, but somebody got a hold of some ship that was sitting out on the water, and um, and I heard all this horrible, horrible squawking and squealing and, and and I don't know kind of noise, twisting, and somebody said, "Well, fire mission over." I repeat, you got a fire mission over. And I, I asked him, "Where where where are you?" Because I knew all the firing batteries were busy. He says, do a 180 over, so I did a 180, and uh, there was only one boat out there. What, what could they do? Probably a three-inch gun, that's about it. I said, Roger, over, uh, I see a boat, and he started laughing, he says, yes, this is the United States uh, ship, uh, uh, New Jersey, send your fire mission over. I said, you're a battle wagon. He said, hey, Roger that. I said, where's your flotilla? He says, oh, do you have a fire mission? I said, yes. I mean, he said, yeah. I said, yes. He said, okay. I said, can you do? Can you work? Can you work a ten-digit coordinate? I've never fired Navy gun. For, I don't even know what you do. Roger. So I gave him a ten-digit coordinate. And so here was here was here was Ch uh, uh, Butch Boyette, and here's this gully about two football fields away, and here are these guys over here. And they're they're standing up and shooting and, mm -hmm. and they got some they got all kinds of ammunition I and mean, they can stand there all day. So I said, give me one of Willie Peter. Not only will that tell me that they landed in the right place, but that'll set the place on fire. And that little piece of that'll burn mm -hmm. me out. So that's so, white phosphorus. It, that's what it is. I said, what, 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 white phosphorus. So I said, Roger that. So he dropped it in the middle of there, and I didn't know any better. I said, Roger, uh, TOT, excellent fire, fire for effect, full uh, uh, broadside. Well, they didn't do that. I, I was told later by some Navy guys, they were laughing at me. Oh, they fired a five inch because they, they can get in there. Mm -hmm. And they, what they did, they fired maybe one or two of the tubes because Butch told me that when it hit, it, it was nothing but rocks and elbows and high eyeballs and all this all over the place and just dec decimated that hill but didn't touch him. Mm -hmm. He said he stood up. He's a tall guy like you, and he went down the hill. So I thanked them for their, for their um, 
excellent work, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't know what I, I never. The thing is, it bothered the, the, the pilot and myself both. I looked at him. I was, I was a little bit closer to him than I am to you, and I said, "What is the trajectory?" Willie Peters different. It, it, it's, a, it's a lower trajectory. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they might fire it this way, but it comes in lower. But when they when they when they, when they fire a, a, with a high explosive round, I mean, it, it'll maintain a high. Is mm -hmm. it going to go through the helicopter, under it, over it? I don't know. I, ne I never did find it. I, I didn't hear anything. All I, when it exploded, I knew it hit. And, and it decimated. They didn't, there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left. So they came down the hill. And then I came, I came down. And, and uh, okay, so I was there. And I went up again because I, we were still receiving fire. And we couldn't figure out where it was, and so I had a forward air, air observer who had been with us for about 30 days from the Air Force. So he says he was flying, flying a little beaver, and he says, "I'll fly around. I'll see if I can pick up something." He sure did. Somebody shot at him. That hill that was over here, some idiot shot at him, and he flew out of the area like a, on, he was on fire. I, I I didn't know what was happening, and then within minutes, two 104s uh, appeared. And, and they hit it with um, napalm, and they burned the thing. I mean, two thirds of that mountain was just nothing but flames and black. So my friendly exec officer comes up on one, and he says, two, this is five, talk from the battalion headquarters. Get your ass down here. So I did. I'm going to court-martial you. Nobody calls in that. You, you had no authority to do that whatsoever. I said, sir, before you court-martial me, do you mind if I, we send a little patrol out, and when they give their report, then go ahead and haul me away. All right. So I sent five guys out. They come back. It took them a while to do it, because they had to climb that hill. It was mm -hmm. all a mess. And they came back and said, sir, there's an there's a, there's a, anti-aircraft gun up there, 14 point Seven. five Mike, Mike. Mike. And they had a five-man crew, and they had enough ammunition here to kill everybody in the valley. And the major didn't even say, well, excuse me. He just, huh, and walked away. But I, what happened is I talked to that captain that was flying the beaver. He said, oh, they, they fired at me. And when I, when I found out what it was, that's the only way I knew that for sure that we could get rid of the target without doing something that would just really disturb you. It was con con it was concentrated in an area away from you, mm -hmm. and and he, he thought that out because he'd been on the ground with us enough to know that if he would have come in there with ordnance, that some of that might have got, gotten in our face, mm -hmm. and and uh, so that was well thought out, well thought out, and uh, so. Um, when I left that place, uh, I left that, and, and we'll get back to him again, because I bumped into him again, but uh, I left that place with a big sigh. All right. Now let's kind of steer ourselves back to the main line of the story now. So you've you finished Fort Hall over So when are you at the University of Maryland then? Uh, I, I worked part-time when I was at... at uh, Fort Halliburton. Mm -hmm. I worked in the defense index for um, it was for the whole Department of Defense, and we had over 600,000 records. Mm -hmm. We had people in there <clears throat> like uh, D uh, D Douglas uh, MacArthur. His, his records were still in there. <clears throat> we could run a background check on him, and what run run rabbit rabbit trails on who he knew. So I became the deputy director for that for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know anything about it. We had punch card machines technology at that time in 1966. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the staff were really brilliant people, some men and women, civilians, and some military. Uh, I forget who the lieutenant commander was, or the lieutenant, a colonel. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was just a captain, and, and so anyway, they loved on me, and they, they taught me everything, and they knew I, I didn't know what I was, I, I did, they, they knew I was lost, but I was going to get trained mm -hmm. in it. So they had a baseball team, and, and they were really good at it. I hate to har arm wrestle with any of those women. They were, they were tough women, and, but they were also brilliant. 
So they send me off with a, you know, all that hugs and stuff and, and, and to University of Maryland. And I started, I guess, in the fall of 1966. You mean just a couple of months after Vietnam, or yeah, well, maybe or your maybe, fall maybe, maybe, maybe it was the fall of '67. Yeah, because you had to do the yeah, training I, course at Fort Harlow first. That's right. Yeah. That's you're right. So uh, I had I, it was uh, the next year '67, and <clears throat> so I went to uh, the uh, University of Maryland, and they were very kind to me. Um, uh, I, I struggled with the math. I did I did well with, with a lot of it. But we, we, we had differential and then integral, and after a while I didn't know if it was mm -hmm. whatever, uh, but math. And then, and then, and then you, you work computers. And I found out <clears throat> in that computer system that if you're, if you're writing documents, you're publishing, I want to publish something, and, and, and you're going to take this and you're, <clears throat> you're going to put it in some kind of f format so somebody can en enter it. <laughs> and it ran into a, a document, and then you publish it. Now, if you're going to run mathematics against that, let's say you had a mathematic <coughs> situation where you wanted to run some statistics in it, there was a different kind of a program that would run that and a different kind of compiler. Well, they taught me how to write computer programs in three different languages. I knew how to write the math stuff. I knew how to write the, the word, word processing stuff. So what I did, I spent months and almost flunked the course. I've spent months building a bridge between the two compilers. I take in a bunch of material information you gave me, and, 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 I, and I'd store it, send the, the specifics, mathematical data that needed to be calculated over here to be crunched, dump it back in the word process, and then print. And I got the thing to work. <laughs> I, I was not saying they, they, they were they, they thought I was, I was just a, I was a you know a freshman and a, mm -hmm. well actually no I started off as a as a as a junior mm -hmm. and a senior and then I was out but some of the stuff uh, in August of uh, '68 so I got in there in '67 the next year in August of '68 my former spouse left hadn't been back since and so <clears throat> I turned myself in I don't know why she left. I had top secret crypto special intelligence background. And I knew stuff where I could decipher things. Mm -hmm. So I turned myself in to the commandant who knew me from the, the, the advanced course, and he assigned me a family, a counterintelligence, uh, counterintelligence agent. Uh, school and uh, a student, and he it was a setup because he he was he, he was going to be drafted, so he signed up in the military so he could not be in the infantry, so they put him in the intelligence business, and uh, so he used to be the youth pastor at the largest Methodist church on Highway 50, and the only time I heard Jesus in my household when I grew up as a youth. Up till the time, even I got in the got in the military. When I go home, uh, Jesus was something when you hit your ha hand or mm -hmm. you went to the bed, went, went to if you're going to eat something or you're going to go to bed, and that's it. Uh, it was a godless house. My, ha my dad was an alcoholic, and and, and uh, he was also an adulterer. So that kind of kept things busy around the house. So I, I had nothing, and I went out of the house. That's why I got out. And you're mm -hmm. right. I. I Thanks for educating me. I was 17 when I got mm -hmm. in the military, not 16. Mm -hmm. But I wanted. I, I started get my, getting out of the place when I was 15. Mm -hmm. It took a while to to to, to qualify. Mm -hmm. So thanks that that helped me out there a lot. So then, so he moved in, and and he he thought it to himself. Well, I better have my wife. His name was Bill Nairges. I better have my wife Bonnie come in and say, it's okay, because we're going to take over the household, take care of Roger and the three children. Mm -hmm. We're responsible for their safety and that he's, he's fed every day properly. Mm -hmm. And he goes to school every day, gets up out of, you know, gets his lazy buns out of, out of bed. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, so she showed up and she was a born again Jew. 
She was a Jewish who loved Jesus. Mm -hmm. That, that, that really helped my children because they needed love or not. They, mm -hmm. they, were, they were so confused with all this back and forth and mm -hmm. noise and racket. And, and, and when I was in Vietnam uh, and they were in, in Columbus, these strange men were in the house a lot, I found out. Mm -hmm. What a mess. So anyway, so they stayed with me and, and I continued on my, my education. Uh, so one professor hired me to write two international, I guess, yeah, international economic courses. And I had exposure to something that, that might be of assistance to him. So I laid out a, I laid out a, a, a schedule of, of putting that together where mm -hmm. you could start off with A and you work to the conclusion here. And so he gave me some high points for that. One guy sat down with me and listened to me about, and I gave him an oral report with all the statistics uh, on how to develop this surveillance in depth using mathematical tables instead of using a computer would zap out and, and could give you everything you wanted to, 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 be, to be able to change, change, change the identity mm -hmm. of, of different geographical regions. So that helped me. Uh, so I got through that course, barely, uh, all of them, where I graduated in, in June of 69. So you were in, we were on the main College Park campus taking courses? Okay. Then I, could, I, was, I took, I took the, the, some courses in Frankfurt, Germany yeah, but, for two years, but, but and then the, the rest of them with College Park. Right, okay. So you're in a major American university in 1968. There were a lot of things going on in this country in 68. You had the King assassination, you had Bobby Kennedy, you had uh, riots, you had the Democratic Convention. A whole bunch of things going on, plus an active anti-war movement. I mean, how much of that registered with you at the time? Were you paying attention to the news, or did it affect life well, on I, campus? I, I, I very, very much attention to the news. You had two things that you were working against. You had the stuff going on internationally, so that was, and particularly where, where we, had, we had just left. But I, I had spent a lot of time in Europe, so I always kept a, an ear for what's going on there. Mm -hmm. What was going on in the United States, didn't really understand what happened to Kennedy. I just knew he was assassinated. Didn't understand why Robert Kennedy, but kept my ears to it. Uh, there was a lot of race riots in different parts of the world, uh, America world, and, and we had some people that came in from Detroit, and I can't tell you how, how we infiltrated them, but we did. We knew what they were going to do before they did it, mm -hmm. and I even when I was when I was going to to college, I, I was e even got down there and I was armed, and I knew how to use. The, or I was not on. I didn't have a. I didn't have a BB gun, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I never, never, never engaged anybody. I, I hauled some people out of the black community, who were very, very well respected by the black community, and what the black community did. <clears throat> On the radio antennas uh, of those ones that they liked, they put a, a black little flag on it, and they were not touched. Mm -hmm. So the, the rioters came in and destroyed the place. Also, the SDS on, 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 on campus. Uh, I'd be walking along with my short haircut, and I'd have a business suit on or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was just for college. And all of a sudden, I felt a, a, a hand on my right arm and another one on my left arm is just just keep walking straight sir where there's a ride over at the uh, where you're headed right now to the where, where the computer building is mm -hmm. and we'll take you in the side entrance just 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 keep walking with this they did mm -hmm. that about three or four times mm -hmm. and every one of us veterans were, were somebody picked us out and watched us boy I tell you and, you know, I, I was unarmed, mm -hmm. and, and I didn't know this stuff was going on, but they did. They were part of the student student union, and student union was kept mm -hmm. informed of this. But I, did, I didn't go to their, any of their meetings. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I do know from my connections back with Hollabird that, um, that they had a good handle on, on some of this stuff, still do. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I took an oath of office to d defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that's one of the reasons why my boys are where they are right now. Mm -hmm. 
So finish that up, and then I was, I also, in, in December, I was a mess. I, physically, I, I was really a mess. And so, um, Bonnie used to call my doctor in Fort Belvoir at the hospital and ask him, how, how, how's the captain doing today? And, and, the, and the doctor would give her a report, and she'd hit the ceiling. So finally, the doctor says, get him out of town. Take him anywhere but this town for Christmas. Mm -hmm. So they took me home to Cleveland. I didn't know that they were scheming. They were schemers. They had women lined up for me to meet. And one of them that I met was, uh, uh, you know, one of these bouncy kind of bubbling all over the place racketeer, uh, uh, shapely thing. And I, I, I cringed in the corner because I, 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 I knew what that was. And I, the fact is, that's out of my house, and I don't need any more of that. <laughs> so that, that was that was done. So then, then on the 23rd of December, 1968, <clears throat> went downtown, downtown, in the middle of town. They have the Higby Tower, and they have a great big department store in that facility. Also, the, the metro comes in underneath, the train comes underneath, and they load and unload. And so that, that's a pretty high traffic place. Mm -hmm. So that evening it was dark, and, and there was a slight wind with a little bit of snow and the air. And this cute little blonde girl came came right right up to my face and said, "Hi, Bill." And Bill and Air just came around on the other side, and she looked at him, and she looked at me. She said, "Oh my goodness, you're not Bill." So we went on our first date, mm -hmm. and uh, we went to some place in the flats, and that's where they sh still show. Still movies, I mean quiet, silent, silent movies, yeah. silent, not still, silent movies, and uh, I had a beer or whatever else, and maybe a little snacky, and I thought, boy, this is this this lovely lady is just absolutely fine. She's not all wrecked by the world hasn't messed, destroyed her. So uh, I took her home, and uh, of course Bill or somebody was with me, and I kissed her on that on, on the on the forehead, and I says, I will see you soon. I just left it at that. And so I was trying to get in my, in my head, because my heart was going like this, that the possibility is, wow, I never met such a lovely woman. I, I, I've seen some others that would throw, throw themselves at you, but you, you don't need that. That's destructive. Yes, and my, I was thinking about my children, too. Mm -hmm. They need a real mother, not a, not, a, not a vacationer. So anyway, I wanted to impress her. How do you do that? Well, you send flowers. So I got a hold of some florist, and I said, hmm, gardenias, beautiful, nice gardenia plant. So we sent a gardenia plant, and I said, um, Charlotte, enjoyed last night, uh, warm regards, Roger. So uh, the disaster strikes the house. The flowers arrive at the Bolts residence, and Ruth Bolts, receives them and begins to sneeze. Hmm. So she opens up the card and it says, whatever it says, dearest or whatever. I, I, I don't think I said Charlotte. I, I, I left that out. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed last evening, uh, warm regards, Roger. So she puts the note down and she hollers and everybody in the house heard, Roger! You've never given sent flowers to me. What is this? <laughs> you talk, that, that's a double disaster. Now he comes down and starts sneezing. They, all of them are allergic to that, the things. Mm -hmm. and, and gardenias, is, I found out, is a very uh, energetic uh, aggravator. So anyway, they got through that, and finally Charlotte came in sheepishly. He says, I met some guy last night. What? You don't even know him. And, and he sends you flowers? Tell me about him. And all these, it says army. And she said, well, when they called me and asked me if I'd like to go out with a, uh, a blind date with a major, she said, she, I found out, she said, well, what's a major? And no clue. They were not in the military. Mm -hmm. He had been in, he'd done some things for the government, but he never was in the military, so they were skeptical of that. So by and by, uh, they invited me, she invited me, they, they wanted her to meet me, so they invited me over. And um, then they found out I was, I was, 
varsity, they didn't know when. They probably thought maybe two years ago. It was months ago. Mm -hmm. And I had three children. And they were very polite to me. And he was, he was very stern and she was more gracious, mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying. And uh, hmm. so um, I left and, and they told her, you just walked into a, 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 a mousetrap. You know, it, 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 they, they, don't, don't get involved with that. You're going to ruin yourself. You have a nice life. You've got a good job. You've got a great education and you're going places. And, and what happened to your, your Jewish boyfriend? He said, I canceled a time with him and spending it with Roger on New Year's and the three children. Mm -hmm. What? So she calls it. They were supposed to go somewhere in Las Vegas, and, and she called him up and said, I have to cancel. And that was the end of him. Mm -hmm. and, and so we went to the movie and watched Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> and that was, that was New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. And so um, I tell people that on the 29th of December, she begged me to marry her, so I did. It was the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, I'd like to take you with me to Europe. Uh, when I go this s spring or, or summer, and I, I, I didn't have orders. Mm -hmm. I, I, I knew that I could go there, but I, they were going to send me really to the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and, and I wanted to get out of Maryland. So she, she, she got up and walked out of the room. I said, oh man, I blew, what did I do wrong? I thought, <laughs> and and, and so, no, she came back and she put a calendar in front of my face. She says, when? Mm -hmm. When are we getting married? So we set the, the 7th of February. So we went down to the, we went down to the local magistrate because I had to get her on orders mm -hmm. in order to move the children with her. Mm -hmm. And we did get orders because the army was sympathetic to what I was being exposed to. Mm -hmm. And Colonel Smith at the military intelligence school reinforced that. He's, he's under gun and I, I, I've got him under security uh, and and so uh, that send him back to Germany mm -hmm. and that'll break the break the get him out of Maryland and Virginia and everything else okay so we went to the magistrate and so the guy, well, I don't know what he said and he said this and then he said that and I said this and she said this and they said now here's it I want you to sign it sign it's your your, your your regular name and you sign it your your new married name so Roger Stuart Talmadge and she showed up, Charlotte Bowles. How do you spell your name? And the judge exploded. She said, what? How long have you known each other? <laughs> so she said, T-A-L-M-A-D-G, and signed it. And he, he said, he's just young people. I <laughs> so anyway, so what I did, and this is a, they ask you questions sometimes. You get in a couple's group and they ask you some kind of questions about yourself that mm -hmm. might be personal. So. What, so I told him, which one of these things I'm, I'm going to tell you is, is, is true or false? You know, I married this woman after, I agreed to marry her after nine days after she begged me. Or, I, I forget something else, mm -hmm. what else I said. And the third thing is, uh, on our honeymoon, the first thing we did is went over to Higby Company and, and inventory their, 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 um, their wares that they're going to sell the next day, their millinery items. And that's the one they missed. That's what we did. She had me in there, and I was in there writing stuff down, and she'd get it, line it up, and I'd write it down. We did that for a while, and then, and then, then I took her home and introduced her. Well, I see the children were there. They first introduced to her, and then I, I took them to where I lived in, in Linthicum Heights, Maryland, uh, during when I was in college, mm -hmm. and and we we're going to clean the place up and leave. Uh, but uh, but anyway, and then then we set the date to get married and the end of March, like the 27th. So, uh, okay, so the church she'd been going to, and United Methodist Church and uh, University Circle, which is still there. Uh, so that pastor uh, married us. <clears throat> he was kind of miffed because I was already married, so he wouldn't give us a marriage certificate. And the parents were miffed. They thought, you know, some, some couples get married and their first child is the gestation period is a little bit shorter than your regular children. So they're waiting for that to happen. I didn't know that, I found it out later. So anyway, we, get, we got married, we moved to Germany, and, and everything worked fine. Um, 
we were kind of sneaky as, as, we, as, as we left America because we didn't want to have the former spouse doing some mean things or blocking us legally or, or just causing trouble like she likes to she was already starting some trouble. Mm -hmm. He called me up and begged me to help him to control her. Who did? Her new husband? husband. Yeah, okay. she, married, she had to marry right away, otherwise she would have been deported. Mm -hmm. The IRS, the INS, got, got a hold of her papers and said she doesn't qualify, but she got married and, and, and then they, that took care of that problem. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when we, when we got to, uh, we got to Europe then, then we were able to, settle down and I took command, well, I, I was t supposed to take care of Army Security Agency in Europe, all of their automation activity, everything. Okay. And where were you stationed? I was in Frankfurt, Germany. Okay. I was in Frankfurt, Germany. And so that would have been Army Security Agency Europe headquarters. Okay. And the dates when you are there? Say again? The dates when you were there? I arrived there. I think it would have been June of 1969. Okay, and uh, how long did you stay? Um, July of 1971. Okay, all right. Uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about then about the duties there and what you were what you were doing there. Well, you know, I, I'd been an outcast everywhere I'd been, so I was an outcast there. I'd never been in the system. They didn't know me from Chicken Man. The Army Security Agency uh, worldwide has their own infrastructure and their own clique and what family, and I was not part of any of it. Mm -hmm. they, had a, they had a guy that commanded the Headquarters and Service Company which was a large organization that was stationed that had concerns in different parts of Germany, but mostly in the Frankfurt um, metropolitan area, and took care of all of the housekeeping of, of, of those troops, uh, include court martial authority and uh, keep, keeping the records squared away, uh, all the logistics for the uh, headquarters, millions of dollars in property. And, uh, and then the unit was spread from Berlin to Esmera, Turkey. At Rhein-Main Airfield in Frankfurt, at the airfield there, <coughs> had two rotary wing helicopters and two fixed wing aircraft that we used for whatever they going to the meetings, because they, they had to go to some meetings in the weirdest part of Europe sometimes, and it was high level stuff that my general and, and the staff was involved in. So they, they, they were operators and I wasn't. Uh, in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, not far, we had a huge, the former IG Farben building was the highest um, business building in 1932, uh, three in, in Europe. And it was built, it was built by IG Farben who had a chemical plant just outside of town about 40 miles and they, 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 they manufactured the, the materials, the gas that killed the Jews. Mm -hmm. They also manufactured things that we use in this country to, to abort babies. They're still in business in the murder business. Anyway, we renamed that building the Abrams Building after General Abrams. It was, that honored him and, and the um, Germans were pleased with that because Abrams was, when he was in command in Europe, was very helpful and, 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 and considerate and, and, and things work well under mm -hmm. his, his, his uh, tour. So anyway, uh, right next door to that, there was, a, there was a building that had high fencing security around it and the thick walls and we had a, a worldwide, worldwide communication relay place that came out of the, from America and ran around the world and came through this site and so that, that the Germans had to protect that from, nobody was allowed to, on, on the other side of the fence. On each, 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 four, on four parts of the roof there, they, we had 50 caliber machine guns and we, anybody get in the fence get killed. Mm -hmm. the Germans knew it. When the SDS showed up, they showed up with water cannons and they just blew those guys away from that compound. So they come in regularly. Now, uh, when, when I'd been there, 
in Germany uh, years ago. I was over there in '57, as you know, to '62. Mm -hmm. I, I lived in, in in housing in in Frankfurt, and I got to know the Germans and a lot of the guys that worked on stuff, and I had beer with them, and and I traded things like a, a, pipe, a carton of cigarettes I could get maybe a gallon of paint or something. Mm -hmm. And and so those guys were still there when I got there as a major. I'd been promoted. Mm -hmm. uh, promoted at the age of 30, I was up of 5%, they picked me up, and that my, my infantry duty did that. Mm -hmm. But when I got there, the Army Security Agency looked, looked down upon, oh, a rolling infantryman. So they, they pulled Major England out of the headquarters of the service company and put me in charge of it and says, there, we'll get him out of the building. So I had a, I had a, I had a muster of all the troops, I had a signal core company in that building, plus our headquarters people. And I told the enlisted men, I said, if you act strange, I'll move you out of the building onto the, this, 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 this concrete blocks all over the floor, you know, on, the, on the ground of the motor, you know, the, where the motor vehicles were parked uh, around the building, and you'll live out there. My first sergeant was the mean as a snake military police. First sergeant, perfect. We got along, we, we, we talked the same language. So I had very few people that I knew that understood what I was saying. We started with that. Those guys destroyed that building between the two units, the headquarters unit and, and the signal. They, they go in there and they take something and they smash the uh, porcelain urinals or, or they take the washing machines in the building and put something in it and clog it up and, 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 and it, it, would, it, would, it would destroy the machine. Uh, they bring their motorcycles inside the building and change the oil and, and where they slept. They throw things out through the windows instead of opening the windows throughout the building. But why were they doing these things? Because nobody was in charge. Oh. Once they left the headquarters, they act like animals. Mm -hmm. now, I knew I knew what animals were. I lived like one for a long time, and we got along just, you see, you see them here, we got along just very well, mm -hmm. but we, we, we clean up after ourselves. That's mm -hmm. the difference. They didn't clean up anything. And, and what they were were spoiled brats. Most, most of them, maybe 90% of them were draft dodgers. Mm -hmm. And how could you, you say, well, how did they get in there? When they found, when their number came up to get drafted, they signed up for four years and they got in the Army Security Agency business because they were brilliant. They had, all of them were brilliant, high IQ idiots. All of them. And, and uh, I, I got along with very few of them. So anyway, I, I was an outcast with anybody that worked with me was an outcast. They didn't like that military police, military police first sergeant either. Mm -hmm. So I forget who was commanding. There's a, there was a general officer that was in commanding, and I had a, a polite relationship with him <clears throat> to start with. and. Uh, they had lost over 50,000. I, I ran an inventory of You always run an inventory of everything you have mm -hmm. whenever you change a command. <clears throat> and they had never done that. And I, I found at least $50,000 missing. And the, and the supply officer that was right on it, in other words, he was willing to, be, he was not, he wasn't, wasn't a brilliant one of those smart guys. Mm -hmm. So he was an outcast. <clears throat> So we planned ways of fixing that. And what we did is two things. We, we went and looked other places besides where we were. I had teletype machines. How, what would anybody steal those for? They were outdated, but they were gone and they were on our books. Well, we found some in Berlin, we found some in Asmara, we found some in all the outstation, because Army Security Agency had outstations that were modern doing things and they had reports, but they weren't using us. We, we found everything except $5,000, everything. And the general had, had it, he could sign for $5,000. We wrote that baby off, mm -hmm. got rid of it. We did that. And uh, then I got together with my buddies. I got uh, my beer drinking buddies. I also went to the 3rd Pulitzer Revere, the 3rd po Police District of Frankfurt, mm -hmm. a mine city talk to them. <clears throat> we had an understanding. Then I went to the military police and I had an understanding with them too. You pick up any, any of my boys for anything, I don't care what it is, you call me. And then we can pick them up. 
and then we take care of them. We don't want them in your system. We don't want anything. That way we could protect whatever. If they were drunk and they, we didn't want them to say something, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want them to mention something about how we keep things secure or anything. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those, were, those, those turned out to be very, very excellent. So I, I went up to the general and uh, we had staff meetings and everybody would report certain things. And he had battalion size and other detachment size senior officers would come in to uh, monthly or bi-monthly staff meetings <clears throat> and talk about various administrative things as well as operational things. One of the things is safety. And they all had these low, low accident report reports. And mine were coming up and theirs were going down. And 50% of my, 50% of my whatever stuff was in some kind of altercation. And uh, <clears throat> so the general called me in the office and closed the door and said, I want to know what's happening. I said, well, general, you want it on a nutshell? You're being lied to. Somebody goes out there and has a fender bender, even if it's $50, I report it. They have a fender bender, they cover that stuff. He said, dismiss, thank you. And he and I got to know each other real well. <laughs> now, he found out about Charlotte. Charlotte showed up in there, and she got in a ladies' club. And they thought she was a, they thought I was a lieutenant. You know, a, a second lieutenant or first lieutenant. They, didn't, they, didn't, they never saw me. And so this is the lieutenant's wife. And so when the general's wife came in, and, and, and she sat down, my wife said to her, Hi, Louise, how are you? Oh, fine, Charlotte. Gee, it's, I'm glad you're here. The women just about died <laughs> because of lieutenant colonel's wives and all that other stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And they, they tried to go after her. And so she turned, she, she turned them around and said, You go check it out with Eloise. Don't you talk to me. Mm -hmm. And she was her own woman. Mm -hmm. don't you, I don't want to hear your stuff. So they got, they got wise and they found out I'm a commanding officer of the place. And I'm in charge of all their personnel mm -hmm. that work for their their husbands, and shut your mouth. So anyway, they, they got along with it, but they found out that she is a she's a priceless cook. She worked for Stovers before they froze everything. Mm -hmm. She has every one of their recipes, and fondue was the thing that was in in '68 and '69 mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I mean '69 and '70. Uh, so the the general had. I had a guy, I think he was kind of a little bit, <clears throat> but anyway, but he was a good cook too. And so they were having get-togethers get and so the general's wife got a hold of Charlotte. I said, do you, have any, do you have any fondue recipes? You know, I'd like it. So she gave him 30 of them, take mm -hmm. your pick. There was nothing for her to do that. All she did is change one ingredient. Mm -hmm. Stouffer required one ingredient change. So it's never ever the product that they've registered. Right. And then, 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 then she helped the cook with, with some, <clears throat> some things you can do with steak and some other things you can do with other kinds of food, uh, the fish. And so uh, that went on for a while. So the, the general, well, when the wife was so thrilled that the general was just, he was beside himself. <laughs> uh, we didn't live in their house, but we, we certainly occupied it with the food side of it. And uh, we tried to slow this guy down because he dressed kind of funny. He really needed to be focus on cooking and not mm -hmm. acting strange. Uh, but anyway, so uh, th that, that went along very well. Now, one of the things I inherited, uh, along with this accident stuff, we had a guy that got drunk one night and he went down an up ramp going from the major road into a major highway mm -hmm. and a tanker truck plowed into him and exploded and killed him. So, all of a sudden, safety became a big issue, mm -hmm. and that's when I had this, this, this thing with the general. Mm -hmm. So, his other people started reporting, right, and, oh, you should have seen their records. Mine, would, mine would, he, he wanted to give me a hug and a kiss, mm -hmm. mine, compared to theirs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, okay, so then, the other thing that happened was, we ran a little club, and, and it was very loosely done. I mean, we, we sold beer, and I don't know what else, maybe hard alcohol. I'm not sure about that part, but we had little snacks, and we call it the speakeasy. 
mm -hmm. a spook easy or something easy. But anyway, one guy went upstairs, he was drunk out of his mind, and he drowned. I had inherited that. How do you stop that? Well, I knew exactly how to do that. But this English said, boy, I'm glad I'm not down there anymore. He didn't know what, they didn't know what to do because they were mm -hmm. in the elite class. They didn't have to worry about trash. Mm -hmm. So we worried about trash. We knew what to do with trash. So what I did is I hired some guys off duty and they were my bouncers and they could handle anybody. Mm -hmm. Fact is when I went in there and danced with Charlotte, they picked me up and hauled me out of the place when it was time for me to go bed by, get out of here. <laughs> Right. And in the meantime, you would mentioned sort of at the beginning of taking over this particular job, you had all these guys making a total mess of the place and trashing it. Were you able to get them um, in line by threatening to evict them, or did you and your sergeant manage well, to get no, them I, 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 There's other little things that we had up our sleeve. First of all, we changed the, uh, the, the order of discipline for things. So I had, I had room leaders that could discipline to a certain level. And then I had senior non-commissioned officers that could discipline to another level. Then I had a first, first sergeant um, discipline, and they stayed away from me because they knew that I was ugly and I had an imagination that would kill a snake. Mm -hmm. So they, 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 and it was hard for them to get an Article 15. That was just administrative. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you about that later. We used it once. Once, I was there two years, and we used it once. I had a couple hundred troops in there, mm -hmm. and I, I went after that captain that had that signal outfit. Went after them too. They had to listen to what we're doing. Haircuts had to be done right. I moved a barber inside, or they can go down the street. Went inside to take care of them for, and they get personal care and all that stuff. This was a this was a, a facility they call them in, in Germany concerns. It was a military compound. I had about four or five of those. The other ones were all named, and I kept certain things in those other places, like trucks I kept in one place, and, mm -hmm. and, and other things, uh, supplies in another. And the, the stuff uh, at Rhine Mine Air Base had, it was all avionics and, and things like that. So, but this, had, this, this compound had no name to it. It had been around for a long time. I don't know what that was, but it was certainly not there when I left it. 1962, and mm -hmm. it must have been installed after that. So, I went downtown to my buddies, my drinking buddies, and uh, I said, what do you think? I said, I don't know. Do, do you have anybody you like? Oh, we like, we like President Kennedy. We thought he was a very good man. Mm -hmm. I said, I think you're right. So, so what we did, there was a whole, there was a whole, every, every concrete wall has, has an indentation a certain size and what they do they build a frame and then they have a flat piece and then they, they paint it and, and put the letters on it and jam it in there and seal it mm -hmm. so what we did we used military intelligence uh, it was gray and teal blue that's a nice nice combination it looks great so they built a sign for me mm -hmm. didn't cost me anything I don't think and, 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 and uh, they put that Kennedy concern and then they installed it. Now we didn't involve the mayor. When you, when, you, when you have one of these things, I found out, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, but we didn't invite anybody. We didn't invite the commander, the, the, the general down. We, we didn't invite um, the, the leadership of, uh, of, of Frankfurt, mm -hmm. Germany, but we, we uh, our drinking buddies came, German drinking buddies came, and, and some of the other guys that worked for me, and we had a little ceremony, and we went in, and we had soda and, and cupcakes or something that somebody made and, or bought, and, uh, and that's how we celebrated that. Years later, I found out from somebody who commanded the unit after me, mm -hmm. oh, so he wrote that down and put it outside his Commanding officer building, how the, how the building was named. What we failed to do is the unit commander, the general, was supposed to send to the USER, which the United States Forces of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, a recommendation to name a compound the Kennedy Concern. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they would whatever consider that, and they, they'd discuss it with uh, some of the ambassador people, 
and they'd say, okay, well, all right, go ahead and ask Bond. So you can send it to Bond, and they think it over. Would that be compatible? And and, and with our, our society, would they be receptive? And whatever. And then they'd send it back to user. User would send it to the United States. They'd rule on it. I think Congress would give their blessing. And then it would be sent over. And a year and a half later, you might get a sign. Mm -hmm. We did it in three weeks. Right. <laughs> now, the building was a mess. So I asked these engineers to come into the building. And these guys are craftsmen. I mean, if the building, if there's something wrong with the window, they could build a whole frame and everything and put that in there. So they went through the building, and in, in 1969, $20,000 worth of debt, minimally, mm -hmm. minimum damage in a six-story building. Mm -hmm. It had two elevators. It had a laundromat that was just terrible. It was, it stank. It was, it was terrible. And, and, and the on and on and on story. And downstairs in the basement, uh, they redid what I call the spook easy. They redid that, put in a nice bar, and, and the ceiling was made out of, you know, there's egg cartons, you turn them backward and you paint them black. Well, that was a fire hazard. I had to rip those out, it's still black. It didn't matter, with white dots where we removed the egg cartons. So that was the stars at night. So we left it. And, and then I had my bouncers, and, and then we earned so much money um, from this, this, the spook easy. And also I had Coke machines throughout the command, and I'd take all the money from it. And I'd use 50% of, of it. So, so Charlotte and I created a travel company called the Red Bull Express. All right. Now this tape is basically done. All right. I am out of time. We're now on session number three with Roger Talmadge, who is threatening to be the longest interview I ever record. But so be it. Uh, we had followed your military career into uh, your second tour in Germany, uh, early 1970s, and you had been talking in the last piece about having taken money from the club that you ran in your building to help finance what you referred to as a travel agency that you had labeled the, the Red Bull Express uh, well before the caffeine-laden drink that came later. Uh, now, with that, you was this something where you paid for the trips, or you just organized them, and the servicemen who went on them had to pay themselves? All right, let me get let me back up a, a mm -hmm. little bit. First of all, as the commander, commanding officer of the headquarters and service company mm -hmm. of the United States Army, uh, six, 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 I guess. Service command, mm -hmm. anyway, whatever it was. Um, uh, the uh, it was administrative in nature, and and so I had court martial authority. I also had uh, the authority to be one of the. Uh, I can approve or disapprove and uh, uh, promotions, even though they worked in staffs that were all over the place, but they were on my morning morning reports, and I had to keep keep. Uh, keep, keep a, that, that current. And I discovered that <clears throat> the men had very high IQs, uh, very low interest in, in, in serving in the combat side of the Army or any, any other service, but they wanted to avoid the draft. So every, just about every, I, had a, I had a whole company full of uh, draft dodgers assigned, like I mentioned before, in, in Berlin, all the way across bits and par parcels of uh, uh, Europe and in, into Asmara, Turkey. And so what I wanted to do was save them from themselves. Now when I was first there as an enlisted man myself in Europe, uh, work, working in the intelligence service, uh, I, I really did a lot of dumb things. I, I still do, but not, not to the volume that I did then. So what I wanted to do is give them an alternative so they can find something that would, that would attract them and they do that instead of these other things which We'll, we'll, we'll sort of touch on a little bit. So, we, so my wife and I created the uh, travel service. And that's the reason we uh, uh, embellished or created the, 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 the spookies so people would, they could have a, a drink and, 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 and a, a nice little snack, nothing, nothing big, not, not a restaurant style mm -hmm. thing, and, and go to bed after their, their, their service or their work. Uh, shift completed, 
and, and there were other things that we did that, that was kind of interesting for them. And we went a step further. We'd even t get their, their wives or families and take them places. And we could use Army equipment. So I, that means I could use a, a, an Army bus. But these things, with, with them, with the enlisted men primarily, uh, we, we used 55 passenger buses to go to places and, uh, and, and such like that. Uh, we, we, one of our favorite places was Amsterdam. And in order to, to put one of these things together, we had to first have, uh, have to, to, to do this. Uh, and we, we didn't know, we'd never done it before, but we knew that there, there must be some way to do it. So one, one of our advisors was Amexco, and, and, and that's, a, that's a travel agency in Europe and other parts of the world, and they're, they're rather inexpensive, and, and they're thorough, and they do the really excellent work in putting together really safe and fun uh, travel spots that uh, are, 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 are favorites. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so we, we, they coached us a little bit and we go out and experiment with that. And then, we, th then something come along and we trade from buses to something else and then we kept on going. So the, one of the first places we went to was Amsterdam. And we went there, uh, I, I forget what, when it was, uh, it, it, it was in the fall of uh, 69, I think it was, and um, or, or later, uh, but the idea was uh, we, we went to a, a bunch of restaurants, we went, we, we visited a diamond factory, a diamond factory, <laughs> my goodness, and, and, and then we went to a pla places where the, uh, they, they had, they had the, the goats or whatever uh, that produced uh, milk, and from that they made different kinds of cheese. Oh, and that was away from Amsterdam, but nonetheless. So anyway, we got into the detail of a whole bunch of stuff and collecting information. Then we went back and we tried to work out, okay, what could we do to have a trip? And you needed a place to stay, so we worked out two or three alternatives, uh, mixed in two or three restaurants, and then we mixed in uh, the... the uh, the, the, the rivers and canals in Amsterdam, we connected them, and we, we would not rent one, but we would rent three or four of those things, mm -hmm. and, we, and we'd set up, uh, they, would tell us, they would tell us how, where to go, because we were going to all the favorite places that they know that uh, the uh, uh, visitor, visitors and, and tourists like. And some of them were um, not so tourist places too, which meant that, that that's where they went their family. So we tried that. Uh, we, we're going to make that up. So we advertised. We never did. We did this before. We advertised in the organization, and it was enlisted men. And when I ran out of enlisted men, we go to the 97th uh, evacuation hospital or whatever it was called in, 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 in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, it was a full service uh, hospital, and uh, we pick up the rehab folks as long as they were ambul ambulatory, could feed themselves, and we baby them. And, and uh, so everybody paid something, but it was it was if a trip cost four hundred dollars, they only paid two, mm -hmm. and the rest of it was paid by our Coke machines in right. our various facilities uh, in Germany. Mm -hmm. And um, and then in Mexico would would give us an idea of how they negotiated for uh, better prices in the restaurants. So the, the first the first trip we made to Amsterdam, the restaurant. It was 26 entrees, just samplings, and so you're coming in and you're going to sample. You're not having a real meal, mm -hmm. so you're not paying for a real meal. But I mean, I mean to tell you, after you've, after you've sampled half of 26, you are you are absolutely loaded. I mean, you 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 have too much to eat. And then they'd have nice nice drinks. They could have, they could be alcohol or non-alcohol drinks, and very nicely done. And you have enough food that nobody got loaded, and that was that was important. So all right, we did that, and 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 we and we tried that. So we tried that a couple of times, and then we ended up with two two buses going to Amsterdam. We had to make sure everybody had their passports, and all that administration was taken care of, and everybody had money. And so we, we continued that, and that worked uh, very very well, uh, uh, and and. Uh, so then we tried other little sh uh, trips. Uh, we, we took them to a lot of castles, uh, some very interesting uh, places where events took place in, in antiqui 
antiquity, mm -hmm. and uh, they they uh, they thought that was wonderful. They took them to, also to the Hague and other places. We got away from Amsterdam, and 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 some really neat small, just very small, fishing villages, and then we'd go from the fishing villages to the northern portions of uh, the Netherlands, where they had uh, a variety of uh, corporations and uh, factories that were they developed. Uh, Gouda cheese and oh my goodness and the samplings there we got, we lo we didn't have to go to lunch there because mm -hmm. we had we had all the samples they had and and there was that people were really glad because so interested and the young people mm -hmm. they they really took an interest in because young people are coming asking a lot of questions and some of them had their wives and some of them didn't and so that that was that was uh, superb so it, that was motivating for us then we said all right. Uh, we took them some more uh, different places uh, uh, around uh, 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 Germany, uh, and uh, n not far distance. We didn't we didn't cross any borders because uh, actually the, the Russians didn't like us going into different parts of the world with <laughs> their world with with busloads of people with. Uh, but you wouldn't go to Eastern Europe. Eastern but, Europe. But did you go that's to right, France or Switzerland, or did you stay? Just in Germany and the Netherlands. We, we, we could go in. We could go into Switzerland just fine. We went into France, uh, but we didn't go in East uh, Europe at all because mm -hmm. we high security people. These these people would have been worth a lot of money if you could mm -hmm. get them to talk, and so and they knew a lot. They were very well educated, but they were also very well entrenched in our systems and how our systems worked. So we protected them in every way. But they, they needed to keep get off the streets and get away from the bad stuff. Right. So then we continued doing that, and on one occasion, uh, <clears throat> we set up a, a, a uh, we, we bought two German uh, railroad passenger pullman cars. Uh, we rented those out, and and they they hauled those on a regular trip to to uh, where they took other visitors uh, from around the world. To uh, uh, to uh, to France, uh, Normandy mm -hmm. was the area, and uh, and they had the, the guys and the and the wives. And we took some people from the ho from the hospital on that one, mm -hmm. and we filled up the train. We wanted to fill up the train. That, that was our goal. And again, they only paid fifty percent, mm -hmm. and the other percent was a Coca Cola company or whatever we mm -hmm. sold out of the vending machines. I call the, my, my boss, the, gen, the general said, I don't care what you do with that thing, that sounds like a good thing, keeps them busy. And our incident rates started coming down significantly, because they'd get, get, get in Frankfurt and they'd get in trouble with something and, and uh, it was just problematic and, and, and we, we didn't want them to lose a, a security clearance because some silly event that they got involved with. So this, this, took, this really helped. So I, 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 I called the embassy and I talked to, I don't know who it was, I said, we're sending a, two railroad cars worth of these fine technicians from, and I told them who we were, so that, mm -hmm. that made them this sensitive. They all got clearances and they need to be really looked after and watched and, and encouraged and kept away from somebody that might want to give them a, a special trip, a touring trip somewhere out yeah. in the countryside. And sure enough, uh, the they, uh, embassy said, well, we'll have somebody to greet them. Would that be all right? I said, yes, that, yes, if you could welcome them to Normandy. They, they'll be all ears. There'll be a lot of questions. And I, I know you have places that have restaurants and good food. And, and, and the guy said, yeah, you heard right. Absolutely. So <clears throat> the guys went on the trip. And I, I, I was very pleased because they were safe on the railroad train. They, they, the folks were very attentive to them. And, they, and they, I don't know what happened in Normandy, and so they came back and they were really excited. You know, these these uh, private first class and corporals and maybe a couple of sergeants, and here they get off the train and there's a two-star general in uniform. Welcome to Normandy. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you. My, what a pleasure. What an honor. And those guys just about died because everybody thinks that, thought as an enlisted man, I'm just mincemeat. Mm -hmm. and this guy thought he, they, they thought they were all four-star generals, and he was trying to greet them. But he was really nice. He was the right guy. Mm -hmm. That's probably why he's the attaché. Mm -hmm. Really, it's probably why he's the attaché. So we thought that was kind of neat. Uh, one of the things that we did when we 
brought them to various restaurants also in Germany, we would go to every side. If we were taking them to a series of castles, we 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 catch the tour guides would tell us that we didn't necessarily go through the whole tour, mm -hmm. but we went to some places like Neuschwanstein and, and and places like that everybody's heard about. Mm -hmm. And I lived in those places on and off for about six years, on and off six years when I was there in the fifties. Mm -hmm. So I was familiar with them, but I, I didn't have the detail. I knew, I knew that they were beautiful and they were well appointed, and, and, the, and the guides spoke several languages, so you had, ne never had a problem. So what I tried to do is link, what Charlotte and I tried to do is link the castle or the, the place that we're going with various restaurants. And we'd investigate those restaurants and we tested the food. And, and we had a great big plaque, it was a two foot by two foot plaque. Uh, 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 plaque and, and uh, <clears throat> those are, they, they, they plaster on one of their uh, one of their windows facing the, the roadway uh, as you approach the uh, restaurant and it was a six-legged red bull and, and it said red bull approved in English and they were so proud of those things could we just <laughs> leave it at the restaurant we never, maybe we never ever came back but the boy we drive by maybe a year later and, and that thing's still hanging on the wall and it, 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 it encouraged, they told us later, that some people would drive by that place, Americans or English-speaking people, and they'd stop at that restaurant because they saw that approval sign. Mm -hmm. And that was nothing. That was just something we just made up out of the blue. And uh, it, wasn't, it, was, it wasn't some nationally known. Mm -hmm. So that, that worked out well. And so we were so pleased. But we worked, we worked very diligently with the, with the police, uh, the military police and the German police, because any time these guys got picked up, I had an arrangement uh, where the lieutenant colonels, the majors, the senior sergeants, and myself would pick them up off the street, and, 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 and we'd get them off the street and, and get them settled down and out of a, a danger of compromise. Mm -hmm. and, and the Germans understood it, and the military police understood it. So that, 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 that helped us uh, as far as I think I, I don't know if I mentioned anything about our our vehicle safety record. Yes, you did. Okay, so that that helped that because they they helped us there too because sometimes they if they were had too much to drink we didn't want them driving and that was that was one of the reasons why our report went way down mm -hmm. and our incident rate uh, with it uh, because of other things they get involved with it. they didn't get in any fights they they get in the main main railroad station and. And, and, and they, they would be very polite instead of being weird. Mm -hmm. and, and the soldiers would bring each other back sober, or, or at least if they were funny, they, they'd help bring them back safely mm -hmm. to their, their quarters. So that, that was self-service, and, and they, were, they were busy doing some positive things. We introduced them some classical music. We'd send them to the border close to Czechoslovakia. There's some wonderful small towns down there where the music was, that was written, authored, and, 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 play, and continued to play there years now, centuries later, uh, from, from Wagner, mm -hmm. and, and the beautiful stuff from Beethoven, mm -hmm. and, 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 and all the other, uh, Mozart, all, of the, all kinds of classical things. And they, 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 they weren't, these guys were regular folks, but when they get into it, they got hooked. Mm -hmm. So that worked out well, and we spent a lot of time doing that. Now the other stuff I was doing is absolutely boring, but we had a we had a we had a rebellion in our, in our headquarters. The military police rebelled because they worked long hours and sometimes double shifts. You know, after an eight-hour shift, you write another you, you run another one because you're short mm -hmm. or something's happening, and and they 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 were, they were not treated with respect. The general wanted that. He wanted everybody to be respect, and I want to find out what was going on. And so, uh, one, one evening, I, they were, they were. I was tipped off. They were meeting in the conference room with the officers, and they had their officers at their meetings for sta the staff. So I walked in. I took my jacket off and said, "I'm Roger. What's your name? I want to know what's going on." And at first, they were scared. They didn't know. They they, they didn't know if they should run. And they told me what was going on. It was small stuff, mm -hmm. small stuff that communicated. You know, you're valuable, and we need you, and you're not doing what I'm doing because you do it, 
and you're called to do it, and you're trained, and I'm not. And that, 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 I could have been a lieutenant colonel saying that. Mm -hmm. I could have been a, one of the majors. I could have been a command sergeant major. But they needed these guys to do work well mm -hmm. and, and, and not be a forgotten entity because they're administrators mm -hmm. and they're low grade. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that spooled into some really great things. I mean, I, I bumped into them even now, and, and it's still Roger, but we respect each other. But they, bought, they really looked after me too. I mean, there's nothing I, I, I couldn't need. Uh, being, uh, my car messed up, and so I took it to one of the one of my concerns, and my supply sergeant, who used to go with us on these trips, to get get them ready. He got some guys together, and they rebuilt my '67 Chevrolet motor, and it ran well. And then it blew up, so I got rid of it and bought another. <laughs> what a Volkswagen bus! But they, they, they were trying to help out, mm -hmm. and so I paid for all the parts, and I tried to pay them. They wouldn't have; they were insulted that I would even dare, uh, even suggest such a thing. Mm -hmm. So I, we had to move. Uh, I, I was told I had to move quickly, uh, in June, and July of, of, of 1971, uh, and uh, they wanted to send me back to the United States uh, to do some work in. The, Pentagon because of my background training in computer science. Mm -hmm. And I told them that we were moving our headquarters from Frankfurt, Germany to uh, Augsburg because they're consolidating mm -hmm. this, some of the Army Security Agency, Army Security Agency uh, assets, and they wanted to have a c composite site that, that would function for all of Europe from that location, and it had a lots of ground around it to, to facilitate this. And what I found out, when they lost $50,000 worth of equipment and they, they, did, they, they had a poor job of keeping up with it, I had everything marked and I had it cut uh, and I had it barcoded mm -hmm. so that if it got lost and anybody else got it, we could find it. I did that to the office too because those, those clever people, they thought just because I was sleeping uh, in this office building across the street, I'd go into one office and inventory it, and then the next day they knew that the next office to be inventory was coming up. So when I when I left the place, they moved the stuff over here to the other place, and so I was inventorying the same stuff the the, the next day. Mm -hmm. So what what we did, we took a I would still have my hands on that computer outfit, so I, I worked up a barcode system for everything, and I went back and I started all over again. And all of a sudden, the furniture wasn't moving. We found out where the holes were. Mm -hmm. Once we got that done, then we started working on some other smaller equipment, which was very vital to our operation. Mm -hmm. And got that done. And then what we wanted to do is, is then as we got ready to go, go to Augsburg, we put them in our trucks. And and I had a I had a guy that had a, had a had a sheet that, that, that inventory of what's going on, what, what series of barcodes went into that vehicle. And they wanted to ship me out of the place. I said, no, I'm not going. I can't do it. I went for the general. And, and the, the people in, 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 in Washington, D.C., in the Army Security Agency headquarters said, well, what, what, let's retire him. If he, doesn't want to, if he doesn't want to go to the assignment, we've got for him. So the general got online and says, blow it out your backside. Mm -hmm. we got to move, and we got to move which will make sense because you take this truck and you unload it in in an orderly fashion. You don't lose anything and your inventory is up and you have it right here and you can double check it. And then you come back to Frankfurt and load another truck or railroad car. It don't matter. But there's, a, there's always a sergeant there that's going to inventory that stuff. So we, we stayed for that and then I, then I left. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, <clears throat> uh, some, some things changed. I got a hold of my and, and, and military intelligence branch, and I said, uh, you know, they, they're making me available, so they sent me to, to Vietnam a second tour. Mm -hmm. And so I arrived in, uh, in, in, in uh, Vietnam, I think, in July of 1971. Okay, so you got yourself out of the Pentagon assignment entirely at that point? Yeah. That's the second time I did it. First time was to go to Germany. Mm -hmm. Second time was to go anywhere. Okay. It didn't matter. All right. Now, but they still needed people. I mean, in 71, they're, they're drawing down Vietnamization is going on. 
but they needed people with your kind of, of specialization or yeah, they needed. They were looking for people to work. And I, I found out later. I didn't go to a combat unit. I figured I would. I didn't go. I was. I was wearing my military intelligence brass, so mm -hmm. I would. I was getting a military intelligence, if you will, a direct or or uh, unassigned assignment. Mm -hmm. So, and the unassigned assignment was these are round out assignments, management assignments out of the normal course of your your your, your travel or uh, career development. So th that's what this was. Okay. Were you still a major at this point? Or yeah, you... yeah, I just made major. I made major after five and a half years being a lieutenant, second lieutenant. Because okay. I guess you were a major back when you met your wife, right? I think that was. I your... had just been promoted in, in October of 58. I was promoted to major and I met her 68. in December. 68. 68. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 68. There we go. Okay. All right. So now, uh, uh, now, what does what does your you're going to Vietnam? What does your wife do? Yeah, that was a problem because we still had the, we had uh, four children then. Uh, Andrew was born, the first of our four boys, and I still had a son and two two daughters from the first marriage. I had custody of the children, mm -hmm. and my wife signed up to raise them. So we coordinated with the Army, and what the Army did is they, 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 they stationed her in Salina, Kansas, uh, which was uh, at a former B-49 uh, bomber stra uh, shape, whatever, no, anyway. Strategic Air Command? Or? Yeah, there, there, thank you. Strategic Air Command site, and, uh, and uh, it was still operational for training purposes. In other words, people would come in and use it and leave, mm -hmm. but there was no, there was nothing there, nothing in the hangars. So they, 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 they were put in a home, a nice home uh, for the family and a nice community, and she got in with the ladies, and we knew the, the, base, the base commander at that site was Lieutenant Colonel Prince. And we knew him from Germany because he, he counseled us with, with the family because he knew, he knew the situation, why, why I was there early with her. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that we had counseling for the children or ourselves as we needed it. So I, 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 let, him know, um, I let him know that I'm, I'm leaving. And he said, okay, that's good. And we'll take care of him like we did in Germany. And, and so they knew him. That was easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she set up housekeeping. I, I, I purchased, I took my, that, that, I, I bought a, a brand new 1971 Chevy station wagon. And uh, the reason I'm saying that, I wanted her to have some good transportation. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a little story behind that that'll come back later. Okay, so she had a new car and the, the, the place uh, was, was, was superb. The schools were fine also. So then I departed for for Vietnam. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and now, uh, where are you sent to in Vietnam? Uh, I'm sent to uh, Saigon itself, and and I, I was part of uh, the um, it, it, it was it was the uh, Army's major command in, in that area. Uh, for for Vietnam, and uh, well, there's the MACV, the Mac, Military M Assistance M MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam. That's the main operation. That's the o that's the over that's over, the overall one. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the, and then and then specifically, I was assigned to um, <clears throat> the uh, embassy, and I worked in USAID, USAID, United States, uh, America Agency for International Development. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I was, in, I was in facility two, and I was in the management directorate. My, 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 my boss was a retired brigadier, I think he was in armor, and, but he was, a, he was a, uh, one of the, he had an embassy rating, whatever, I don't know what it was, it would, would have been, it would have been a high level senior officer within within the uh, embassy uh, complex mm -hmm. and our job was to fund find funding or at least get budgets and work with budgets 
in such a way that uh, everything was accountable. So we could, we, whatever money the embassy received, uh, and, 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 and if it was in an area of construction, uh, we could see what was allocated and, and, and allocated and follow, follow the trail from, from beginning to end and be able to report on that in a sensible way. That means the director would, would go to the upline with those reports, maybe using one of us as uh, the source, because uh, we went on, we visited a site sometimes when and necessary. So we built, uh, we built field hospitals, and those field hospitals were kind of unique in the sense that <clears throat> they weren't manned by American personnel. They came from Australia. Australia sent in military personnel, surgeons and doctors and nurses and all kinds of things, and, uh, but they didn't bring any guns. And so they got in there, and as we traveled around, we'd visit those hospitals as they were operating and give a report on that. So the money was used to pay for that, but also to run, to operate the thing later on. Uh, we, also, a lot of uh, equipment came in there, and we, we wanted to see it operational. And if something wasn't operational, we wanted to replace it, if it couldn't be repaired. So it so would be state-of-the-art and, and operational. And we had people come in there from Cambodia, every, everyone was Laos, different places. They would come in, uh, uh, that was where they could walk in or, or somehow get into uh, our, our area of, uh, of, uh, of Vietnam, which would have been the Three Corps, which is a side yeah. com yeah. complex. And, uh, and of course, we took care of uh, the babies uh, uh, and, 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 and any surgery from the um, folks that were living in that gen general area. I think if uh, somebody were, uh, even the, the enemy that got hurt or banged up or torn up or whatever, we, we, they would try to help them and then transfer them to the, where the next place they should go if they were, as they got, uh, regained their health. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was one of those efforts that uh, it was inclusive instead of exclusive. And it, it also was well run with a proper attitude towards life, and we liked that. We built airfields, we built uh, secure co compounds for uh, units to operate their logistics uh, function. Uh, we also paid for Air America. Can you explain what that was? I, mean, I know what it was, but can you explain what that was? Well, we had two kinds of airplanes. We had the silver kind to travel around the countryside, and they were our daytime operation. And they were kind of out in the open, but they, they, they handled uh, our essential uh, travel of our embassy personnel, military personnel, uh, as, as the embassy had, had coordinated uh, to accomplish anything within the, I guess you could say, the Asian part of the world. Uh, the black uh, uh, aircraft were, were cargo and personnel carriers, and they went to unexplained places at night and uh, next day they'd come back at night and we cleaned them up, had them cleaned up and, and they, they were uh, parked mostly at uh, Tonson at Air Base, mm -hmm. which is just uh, on the outskirts of, of, um, of uh, Saigon. Saigon. I lived in two places. The first place I lived was in uh, five, five Oceans. Uh, it was a bachelor hotel, if you will. And we were contiguous to um, we were contiguous to a, a, an outdoor shopping uh, center thing for Vietnamese, and it's amazing who came in there. We we I, I don't know who, but it is still there today, and and all kinds of uh, materials would come in there. And the reason why it was important to us because it was a, re a real interesting and easy place for them to get somebody in there that could blow something up, and. Maybe, maybe disturb the Vietnamese, but mostly disturb us. So we had security on our, on our facilities that was very strong, it was American, as well as the Vietnamese security forces. And in this uh, uh, complex marketing area, we had them there too. And they, we had them in, in these, these little towers that, that didn't rise, but maybe a, uh, half a story, and they were strategically located throughout the entire uh, shopping center area. And at night, I know when I was on duty, I, 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 I really thought that some of those guys were sleeping, so I'd throw rocks at those, those, those tin 
roof things and they'd make a horrible noise and I'd hear some guy, ah, oh, he'd fall out of his chair or whatever, I don't know, sleep, sleeping. But I wouldn't let him sleep because mm -hmm. that was dangerous. And we had other hotels that didn't have that, uh, that, that kind of a connection, so they, they, their security was more direct and, and, and vulnerable. And then later on, <clears throat> uh, I was moved out to near uh, Tansanut and, and uh, near, the, near the air base. So that, that security was, was a change. We had security around our hotel, but we were also within blocks of the, the security that was around that Tansanut, and that mm -hmm. was important to us. Likewise, uh, my, my buddy and I had earned some extra money. I kept, I sent all my money home, so I earned some extra money running the movie house at night, and that's how I, 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 I that's how I lived the, the month. Mm -hmm. So if I didn't, if I ran out of money, well, I didn't. I didn't need anything, mm -hmm. and I, I like I like those 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 uh, little twisty cigars. Smoke one of those once in a while. The food was excellent. We had it in different places, and and it was cooked by a mixed staff. Uh, but I think they did a really superb job, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of that was kind of neat, and, and how that worked. Um, So what's the time span in your days? Was it July 71 to July 72 or? I was there from July 71 to July 72. Yeah, okay, so one, one year tour. Okay. Now, a variety of things happened during that time span, including the Easter offensive in 72. Um, I think things had been relatively quiet militarily in much of 71, not big campaigns except for Lamson 719 in the north. Uh, but did you were, did things stay pretty much the same in terms of how you observed the way the war was going or the way your job worked, or did you notice changes over time? There were changes, and they were they were predictable. We just didn't know where. We knew that when when the new year came and Tet translate that to a time where the 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 the, uh, the Orient is 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 in some kind of a mode of expansion and. and Assuring themselves, and, and, and in this case, they, they, they'd start they'd, they'd start huge amounts of personnel into various areas concentrated, and it had been happening ever. I mean, I was over there in '66 when it's the turn of the year, it's around what it was January, the February time frame, and they came, they were coming over the border in different places, and they, and coming en masse, and other places were kind of blank. So they had concentrations, and over the years, 67, 68, uh, almost decimated the country. All the beautiful, wonderful uh, uh, religious uh, uh, architecture and, 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 and other things that made Vietnam very unique were destroyed. And then 69 and 70 and 71, and then I got in there after that. Uh, in July, but but then certainly in January and February, here they come again, and and, and they they were coming over. They, this time they they were coming pretty heavy over the DMZ. So they were coming uh, out of North Vietnam into South Vietnam, and they had, instead of two or three, they had more <coughs> more uh, troops to, to to help them, and also they came across with at, at some time. Around that time, or, or after, with tanks, T T seventy six. Well, there was a big offensive in the spring, so it was after Tet. There, I mean, they call it the Easter offensive because of when it happened. So that and that's March, March. Yeah, yeah. And they came in with heavy conventional <coughs> forces, which was really something new, uh, and in part because the American presence was a lot lighter than it used to be. That's right. And also, it made our it made our. Uh, our protection of these orphanages vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Now the Catholic Re Relief Society, we funded them. We gave them everything they needed. They, they needed a, a truck, a, a car, whatever, vehicles, food, uh, and a anything. We, we, but we didn't provide them. We didn't provide them any real security. Mm -hmm. They might have had maybe one or two folks there, or, or maybe more. I, I'm not sure about that. But I do know that those are those are important to us, and we had them marked, and and we would we would debrief with their leadership, and I was part of that. It was about that time, about March or April, that I became the 
director of refugee operations for the, for, the, for the embassy. And what they did, because of us military, whenever they got short, if somebody transferred out because the tour was over after whatever, mm -hmm. three years, uh, why we would be the interim and we would cover a, a position as long as we were supported by our upline. And, and uh, so our, our support said, okay, let, let them do it. And <clears throat> I, I, the access I had to how that system worked was, was excellent. So I, I got some good information, in other words. And I found out that, that these, these, these uh, forces were going into those orphanages and they'd kill the men and they'd ravage the, the, the nuns and they were running the, 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 the children of various ages and they came from, we don't know who their daddies were, but some of them were Americans. Mm -hmm. And and so that's all we, you could tell, you could know that they are. And nonetheless, they were run into the jungle and tigers would eat them. I found that out on my first tour, when you get out in the mm -hmm. jungle. So we put two large marine units just as a holding force. You couldn't stop them as a holding force and then put landing ship tank uh, ships at, at, on the beach and, and emptied out uh, I don't know how many orphanages but as many as we can we got the nuns we got the priests and everybody out and then and then and then re retracted the, uh, the, the Marines best we could took those vessels and came down the coast of, of uh, South Vietnam and into up the river in Saigon itself mm -hmm. And, and then we confiscated all of the State Department housing. Every big, everybody came for, became foster parents, whether they needed to or not. And so we had C-130s, uh, combat air, aircraft coming in from uh, the, the west coast of America with pablum and, and, and baby wipes and diapers and all kinds of stuff. And also our hospital uh, support, we, had to, we needed some support because some of those children were ill. And so we got, we got them stabilized, basically, that's what happened. Meantime, uh, through the embassy, uh, they were able to negotiate with seven adoption agencies from uh, Oregon to the southern tip of, of California. And, and they, they geared up. I mean, I, I don't know what they did, but they threw money at those agencies and, 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 and they, they people. And then we loaded our aircraft up and we'd fly in with whatever supplies for, for um, Vietnam and fly the babies out. And they had, they had people on board to, to keep, them, keep them stable and all right. And as far as I know, all 2,500 of them made it to the States safely. Mm -hmm. And they're in this country in three, three uh, generations right now. Now something happened in that tour too, which changed my life. About that time, while that was going on, my former spouse had sent her husband over to where we were living in Salina, Kansas, mm -hmm. to the to the air base, and convinced my wife that uh, my former spouse, their mother of the, my, the three children, my son and two daughters, mm -hmm. was there, and she was just feeling not not too she had a headache or something. But he was going to pick, pick them up and take them down to visit mom and then bring them right back. And we had such altercations with her and her new husband and he was having trouble with her anyway and he asked me for my help and I hung up on him. I wouldn't talk to him. I didn't give him, I wasn't I wouldn't nasty and say, well shame on you. So anyway, the sheriff came over to the house and, 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 and took a statement from him that yes, she's downtown, downtown and, and to take her to visit and bring her back this afternoon. Well, this afternoon arrived, evening arrived, the next day arrived, the sheriff was, was livid and they put an APB uh, out for those children. And he, he, kept, he kept close to him. He was only the, the husband that was with the children and he, he was he was rather forceful with him and uh, he only got the girls the son was in a school somewhere else in Arkansas or Oklahoma mm -hmm. and <clears throat> so they, they got into Baltimore and we found out where they live and, and, we, and we, we got my, my, my attorney and, and the authorities there got a hold of the 
with the Baltimore County Police, I went to the house, knocked on the door, and they were told, "Oh, well, we we got we got permission." Oh, okay. And they walked away. My wife was getting a hold of me. My wife was thinking I'm going to divorce her. She she lost. She weighs normally 125 or 28 pounds. She got down to 90 pounds. Uh, my our our baby. Andrew was throwing up all the time. There was such stress in the house. Mm -hmm. So the Red Cross called me home. The commanding general that I was working under allowed me to use his private phone to call home every night. He wanted to get a report every morning. And sometimes the operator would call up and, what are you using official lines for? I'm going to report you. You're talking dribble. They didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I said, fine, make sure you spell my name right, but here's the, here's the, here's the contact for this phone. And mm -hmm. they said, well, we know that. And I hung up on him. So anyway, I got home and, uh, and you know, we had a, it was a crying welcome, I tell you that. And so somebody babysitted uh, our son, because that's all we had in the house. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I traveled <clears throat> 1,500 uh, miles, made a phone call in to find out where they were, and my, it was a confirmation phone call that when one of, one of my daughter called the house to talk to my wife, and when she was on the phone, <coughs> the mother came and slapped her and took the phone away. So we knew that we knew that we had a confirmation they might be in that house. Mm -hmm. Call out of didn't have call yeah, caller ID, mm -hmm. but you could do some other ways of getting that information. Yeah. So we drove around, we, 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 we found the house at night, and then we drove around, it was a holiday, the ne so the, the next day was Monday, and then after that was Tuesday, which the schools were open, and we found the elementary school they ought to go to, we weren't sure. So what I did, <clears throat> I dressed her up as a housewife, and I put big curlers in her hair, and, and she had a <clears throat> sort of a, a, a some kind of a, she had a gown on, a nighty, night gown, and, and a coat because it was November, it was cold. And I was down the hill with the engine running with that same Chevrolet. So, <clears throat> and what's interesting when you run an operation like this, people don't pay attention to the unusual and the usual. She looked like everybody else. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, she was walking away from the school with the girls instead of towards the school with the girls. And nobody noticed it for three and a half hours. And that's how we've done some other little operations like that when I was over there in the 50s. We, different things would happen, people wouldn't understand. So no, I was trained to do that. So why wouldn't the authorities help you? I mean, if you could establish, or shouldn't they, they know that the permission thing was a lie? Or wouldn't they have been told that? Couldn't they have gone back and gotten them? The uh, judge in Baltimore County didn't care. And later on, while I still had the children and I got the girls back, he cut a court order that I would pay, I would pay uh, uh, child support to them. So I was persona non grata in the state of Maryland starting in 1972. And it stayed that way for a while. So anyway, uh, so we got her back, we, I, I got into Pennsylvania and I phoned Salina, Kansas to my attorney mm -hmm. and uh, got a bench order that protected me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't doing anything, well, it wasn't illegal, and nobody was hurt, and all, any of that stuff. Got him back home and, and, and it was very difficult. I mean, my, my, my older of the two daughters was, was wet, wetting the bed and all that kind of stuff and really messed up psychologically and that's where I got, again, this uh, Lieutenant Colonel Prince because he, he knew us already, and, 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 and uh, uh, when, we, when we were in uh, Frankfurt, so now, now that, that, that was, that, so he could, he could attest to before and after, mm -hmm. and so he, he, he showed up in the courtroom. So after that, uh, and, and, and of course the police, they were told that, 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 that it was okay, and they did nothing, mm -hmm. and yet was a civil authority against a, a civil authority, and so that we were stuck with that. Mm -hmm. So I got her, got her home, got them home, and a print, a Colonel Prince sent over to me, uh, to us, uh, a, a, um, 
a male army nurse who was a counselor, advisor, psycholo mm -hmm. psychologist, and uh, <clears throat> Willis Accordo, Captain Willis Accordo. And I was desperate. I didn't have any answers. I was mad. I was furious. And I didn't know what to do with that either. I had responsibilities and I had to leave the next day. Mm -hmm. I couldn't stay home to protect my family. Mm -hmm. So this guy was going to do two things. He's going to protect the family, but also he was going to go through some kind of a process that would help them get stable again. And, 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 and also the son was in Oklahoma to protect him. We didn't want to shenanigans with that either. So all that was set up. And then what he did, he gave me a New Testament. He was a Gideon. I didn't know that. And he wrote it, and I, I say, "Oh, yeah, I need one of those." So he wrote it his name to me, and he wrote it, signed it his name, and the date was 18 November, uh, 1970. In that case, it was, it, it was 71. Mm -hmm. It was before that we yeah. evacuated the babies. Right. And uh, so uh, I, I, I got on the plane uh, the next day, and the three things you do on an 18-hour flight: you either sleep read the Testament or eat. Mm -hmm. and that's what I did. I got into Saigon uh, and, and I went, went back to work and it was a mess and I still had this connectivity using the general's phone just to check up once in a, mm -hmm. once in a while. I didn't have to do it every day anymore. And, and uh, so uh, I finished up uh, with, he said start in a chapter uh, starting with page 179. It's the book of John. I didn't know where it was. Mm -hmm. I finished that, I didn't know what to do with that, and you and nobody else were there to tell me, what, what, what do I do next? So I went to the front of the book, and that's Matthew. And I went, I read, I read the book of Matthew slowly. I was reading it for myself. I'd heard it before. I'd been to church many times, but I knew my heart, and, and, and I wasn't good enough, and all these wonderful people around me, they're good people, but I have a dark heart. So I, I just never made any decision, ever, mm -hmm. ever, never. I've been in synagogue, I've been in Catholic church, I've been in Protestant churches in University City, nothing. So, I um, read the book of Matthew and I was, I was startled to note that Matthew must have known John because a couple things in there are the same. That was, that was interesting. I don't know. So I kept reading and I got into the book of Mark and the book of Mark I found out is just like this device here, it's, it takes pictures, it's just snapshots. Mm -hmm of Jesus doing, doing stuff. He was busy and there was no, it, didn't, it had no real explanation. It, it, something would happen and, and, and you, 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 you could see it, mm -hmm. but there was no, it, 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 it didn't have any words to, to embellish it. So I went through that and I got into chapter 15 and they already crucified him. They had him hanging on the cross and he was bleeding and he was dying and he gave up the ghost. And the centurion who was also a soldier that rose from the ranks. I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And he was in charge of the cohort or, or, the, or the detachment of this very important uh, crucifixion. Now, I didn't crucify anybody, but I, I came out of nowhere out of the bottom, and here I am a major, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I could have, have be, 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 I'd, I'd already been in charge of hundreds, and worth million, hundreds of millions of dollars, all that equipment and stuff. And I thought, hmm. And he said, this truly is the Son of God. So I got on my knees on the 25th of November, 1971. I said, Lord, I can't handle this. I can't do it. So I came to the end of myself in 1971, November the 25th. And I've not been the same since. And I'm still in basic training. So I let my wife know. She was, she was thrilled. She thought I was a believer already because mm -hmm. I was already a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Nice guy doesn't get you anything. Okay, they, they were pleased with that. And uh, so the embassy people took me into their, under their wing because they, 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 they do have things that go on on Sunday and other things that go on. And they got me involved and so I, I began to learn to read that Bible. Mm -hmm. Then I, okay, so then I went through the moving the, the, the babies, and there were some mm -hmm. other things that we did uh, that, that were very helpful to lo local communities. Because I, I, I lived with the Montagnards on mm -hmm. and off for weeks uh, with a combat unit, and mm -hmm. so we tried to do some things 
uh, again, leaving the door open. One of the things that we did, and this sounds, this is wild. Ben, what was it? Clint. Uncle Ben's uh, uh, brown rice, mm -hmm. whatever you call that stuff. Yeah. We, we, we the, 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 the folks planted that in our agricultural programs and we tested it and then we proliferated that as much as we could across South Vietnam and for the first time towards the end of well end of my before I went home in 1972 we became self-sufficient and to, enough to export rice and feed all of North Vietnam and that broke our hearts when they, they, they came down and started destroying those paddy fields we got that far and that was excellent. In other words, we, we were able to get we, the money we had. We didn't have to. We didn't have to. We didn't have to uh, go in and ask for seconds. Mm -hmm. We used what we had well and had left over because some of this stuff was really beginning to work. Our, our 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 construction work was caught up. The hospitals were all functional. Everybody was basically safe. As you were engaging in these various projects in different parts of Vietnam, uh, were you dealing with local South Vietnamese authorities as you did this, or did you just stick with the Americans? No, I worked with the Americans, and and, and uh, that did not. I got reports from I got reports from the field or or from the whoever the site contact was, but I, I didn't speak. I had somebody with me as a driver, but no, I didn't have an interpreter with me a anymore. I was on my own. And, and so uh, uh, I, I traveled different places, and, and we'd, go in, we'd go into a village and didn't know anything in it, and, and so whoever was there would take us down to some Vietnamese restaurant. I don't know what I ate. I might have eaten snake and never known it, but I, I, I knew I was afraid of that stuff. So, so I ate, ate a lot of uh, things that were um, boiled or you know, and, and it, it was, it was wholesome. It tasted great, but it, 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 I made sure it didn't have any meat in it because I didn't know what it was. I, I wasn't going to do something that was going to get me. All right, because part I guess part of what I was interested in was I mean, they, there were substantial problems with with corruption uh, in the South Vietnamese regime and the South, and with what happened to funds that the Americans sent over and where they went and what happened to them uh, and. Does I, so I was kind of curious. Did you were you aware of that kind of thing, or was the nature of your operation different, so it wasn't an issue? We were sensitive to it, not really aware of it in the sense that we caught it, caught that stuff going on. Mm -hmm. But the people we contacted, and we looked at the product that was laid down or or, 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 or raised up, whichever, or you, or, or we get we get. Uh, I didn't I didn't go to any rice paddy fields, but we got these mm -hmm. these field photographs from our, our sources mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and we put in X and, and got Y plus out of it. So we didn't have to put in X again, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and so those reports were positive. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I had very little contact with the Vietnamese. I stayed away from downtown because a lot of our guys went downtown for entertainment or whatever, uh, food and stuff. And the, the places we got blown up, and they came. They, they, they we took. We hauled, They were hauled out in body bags right through it, uh, uh, mm -hmm. And so we stayed away from that. Uh, one one night we went over to Tonsonut to watch a, a, a very uh, uh, one of these adventure films that were being s s sent around at the time. I forget what it was. It was a motorcycle movie, and it was mm -hmm. kind of fun to uh, watch that. And doggone it. Those idiots hit the hit the airfield with 120 millimeter mortars. And we had to run. <laughs> never did get. I, we never got a rain check on that. Okay. Uh, did you have a sense of how the larger war was going? Are we winning, losing, treading water, or were you not even thinking about that? Wasn't thinking about it, but kept an eye on it in the sense that when they were dropping B-52, uh, uh, making an arc light uh, raid uh, in, in the mountains around us, we knew that there was problems, mm -hmm. and that, but that was recurring. Didn't know what the buildup was looking like, but it was coming, and we, 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 were, we were very concerned about that. But we also had a, a, 
uh, some modicum of assurance that, uh, well, just keep busy and you'll be fine. So I played, I played, <clears throat> my roommate and I played tennis, and so uh, we, and we didn't have any weapon except the tennis racket, no pistol, nothing. And so uh, we, we just had got through the day, we ate and we did, did the things you did. You got up early and you worked all day about 10, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. And then we took a, an hour or two and we played tennis with the uh, popular forces, these 15 and 16 year olds, young, young men that would have been equivalent to our junior National Guardsmen. Mm -hmm. And they were trained, they were trained. They, they were sharp, they were fast, they had a, uh, had a great smile. <clears throat> a lot of them spoke English. To me, that, that meant they, had, they were a good skill set bunch. Mm -hmm. And they were in, in, in Saigon itself, and I'm sure that they would have uh, connected with any military unit, the Vietnamese unit, they, they needed to if they needed them. But we put the word out to the, we, we also played t tennis with the president's <coughs> helicopter pilots, four, all four of them. And uh, we, we would put the news out, uh, do you tell the president that these guys, and you have their names, that we, you know we go down here we, every afternoon and we play tennis with them. You put their names down and make sure that they never, ever become ambassadors for this country. And of course they asked us why, and they knew the answer, but the answer was this, they never let us win. We'd get ahead, and they and they duck their heads down and feel bad as they oh we're losing, and then they just tear us up and it'd be mm -hmm. you know like whatever it was, and we, we were zero. <laughs> but if we did it, we did it a whole year of that, mm -hmm. a whole year of that. But anyway, okay. Now, um, as a large scale offensive is going on in early '72, was there some kind of concern that this? might be it or things were going to go south or as the director as the director of uh, refugee operations i was very concerned with what was happening from the dmz mm -hmm. they, they had come across a large group i don't know if two or three divisions and that's a large yeah. group that that's what i was we were facing in in, in the iodrang valley in 65 and that those three didn't do so well mm -hmm. but we hadn't been bombing anything in the North Vietnam, <clears throat> again, our, our numbers were beginning to drop. My unit pulled out in 71, my complete division, yeah. all 15, 16,000 of them mm -hmm. were gone. And so I, that's, that's probably why I didn't go back to them. Plus I was an MI officer on a, on a, on a assignment, a management assignment, assignment. I also had my security clearances, so I was aware I was given I had privy to information, so when we built something or we supp supplied something, we, we, we knew how to handle it mm -hmm. because it was classified for those silver or those black aircraft at Ans to Tansanut mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, the, and the equipment that went on board <clears throat> or the people that went on board. All right, uh, we have hit another hour here, so we're going to pause, rewind.